The Barracks Emperors, a card game set during the time of crisis. Despite the title, despite the historical topic, and despite the publisher GMT, this is not a war game by any stretch of the imagination. It is a hybrid between a card um, a trick-taking game and an area control game. Depending on how you look at it, it is a trick-taking game in which all the tricks are available on the board at the same time. Or it is an air control game in which you will play cards to take control of, of these cards that are on the board at the beginning, representing emperors. And then uh, the control is adjudicated by using trick-taking. Again, it's a perfect hybrid between those two well-known ideas. At some very high level, very abstract level, we are basically fighting in the 3rd century trying to, uh, to collect, uh, well, as much influence as possible. In truth, again, we'll be playing influence cards uh, from our hand and uh, then we'll do that to try to collect these Emperor cards and uh, when... Uh, so as you... as the game progresses there will be fewer Emperor cards on the board. There will be a time when it's impossible for somebody to play a card legally. We'll see what that means. At that point, the player reveals their hand. That triggers the end of the round. Rinse and repeat. Play three rounds. And at the end of the third round, you score points. Each Emperor card you collected is worth a point. Each set of the three types, red, blue, and yellow, is worth three extra points. That simple. Play with the highest score wins the game. So, we're going to have our influence cards. We're going to have a hand of four. When it is your turn, you play a card legally, uh, meaning next to a symbol of your own faction. As you can see, all emperors have the same four symbols. The sword, the eagle, the pillar, and the wreath. And they're all placed with the same orientation. So depending on where you sit, that is your that is your faction. So if I'm sitting here, now I am sword. If my friend Scott is sitting there, that's eagle. And Dylan is sitting up there, so that's pillar, for example. You always have to consider those four factions. So with four players, one player per faction. Uh, with two players, a player will control two factions and the other player will control the other two factions. With three players, the read is silent. So we don't we play it as, as a neutral, is a neutral faction, so to speak. You can also play with four players in teams, so, so uh, the two players are a team and the other two players are a team. Whatever the case, uh, the mechanism is always the same. You will uh, play a card from hand if you can, or you reveal your hand showing that you cannot play a card. When you play a card, you need to place it next to your own icon. At the beginning of the game, as you can see, when we have uh, so many slots available, that means that uh, almost every space is open to everybody, with the exception of the spaces on the edges. And so suppose that I am a sword, then I can place it there because it's next to my to my thing. It needs to be an empty. It needs to be an empty uh, spot. After I place a card, I suppose I place that one instead. After I place a card there, we check to see if an emperor is triggered. That happens if if. An emperor is completely surrounded by card after a card was played. And suppose I just played that card and I am sword and I saw that's the situation that I caused. Now we look at the card that wins. If so the color of the emperor is the trump suit that wins. So if there are cards of the color of the trump suit then the highest in that suit wins the trick. If there aren't any, then the highest total of the remaining ones wins. How about ties? Ties cancel each other out. They just count as if they weren't there at all. And so, for example, in this case, well, we got a six of blue, so that card wins the game. Now, that card is touching the pillar, so this card is assigned and goes to the pillar 
player. Hey, but I was the sword player and I played it there. Yeah, that was a bad play, unless I am in a team with Pillar. So the card that triggers the scoring of an Emperor is not necessarily the one that will win it, for sure. And it doesn't necessarily belong into that player. So suppose that that happened, now the Pillar player collects the Emperor. Also the card that won the trick is the Scott, and that's why the board becomes smaller. So now you see, as I said, uh, as time goes by, fewer options become available. So that's the general idea, that's the main mechanism. It's gonna take you a while to wrap your mind around that. It seems simple, and it is simple, but then playing cards so that it benefits you more than the opponent, not that simple. To that, you need to add the fact that there are unique effects. So when I play that card, for example, this is what happens, I implement that effect. A lot of different effects. Now, some effects had that elaborate little edge around their, their value, which uh, means it's a reminder that this is a standing effect. You, otherwise, uh, you resolve it as you play the card, and sometimes it's mandatory, and sometimes it says may. So that is the general idea. Now it's uh, the time of crisis, so we have all of these emperors here, but on the edges of the board, the, the barbarians are coming. These spaces with the double axis there are homeland spaces, the barbarians. When you set up a round, you place the, the emperors there and you place four barbarians. They come from a specific deck. Also, you will shuffle barbarians into your main draw deck. There will always be 10 mixing there, and so it'll become a mix of mainly influence cards and some barbarian cards in there. If you have a barbarian in your hand, you can play it in one of two ways, and the card reminds you, you may place it into any homeland space, just like so, that's a legal play, or you show it and you discard it to move any active barbarian to a diagonally adjacent connected space, just like that. Boom. Simple, right? The barbarians can indeed move to spaces that contain influence, and now whatever influence you had there, they're busy dealing with the barbarians. You don't remove the card underneath because there may be game effects to remove that card, in which case, surprise, that is available again. And of course, these are neutral cards later when you count for influence. Maybe an emperor is entirely surrounded by barbarians and then the that play that triggers that um, simply will remove the emperor that was entirely surrounded by barbarians. Now, so the idea is again is super simple. During your turn, play a card in a legal position. Uh, suppose again I am the sword and so I'm placing it there. I don't know why I would because I'm really helping Eagle by placing an eight of the Trump suit there, but that's it is what I did. It is what it is. I did what I did. You play your card. You check to see if an emperor needs to be resolved. Ah, turns out, yes, so this is resolved. That is entirely surrounded. Eight of Trump. So this goes to the Eagle player. Winning card removed. And then you get a new card, and you get a new card from the forum. See, there is a, here an area with four cards, and uh, they come out of the draw deck, which again is a mix of barbarians and influence cards. And you always place them in, uh, in ascending value, with the lowest values here and the highest value here. Because the number on the card that you played will tell you how big your range of choice is. By paying an 8, I will have to take the card that is here, which is the lowest available. Which is not always low. Sometimes the lowest is a 5. And sometimes, you know, you really want a Barbarian. So that's the perfect combo if I can pull that off to play a powerful card and then I am actually happy with what I get. Then you draw another card from the draw deck and you reconcile this one. Then the next player goes. The next player, for example, plays a 0 or a 1 or a 2. Now they have the full choice. So the more cards, uh, the, the lower the value that you play, 
the more choices you have. The higher the value, the fewer choices you have. It's a very simple, very intuitive, very effective um, mechanism there for a bit of a rubber banding slash negative loop. Unless, again, you want to have an 8 followed by a barbarian, then good for you. You were able to spam the negative loop and turn it into positive. That is really good. This is the general idea. Play card if where next to your icon. If an emperor needs to be resolved, resolve it already and uh, get a new card. Continue until a player can't play because there just aren't any free available icons of their faction where they can play a card and then you you reset the board for one or two more rounds again the standard game will be three rounds you can choose to play it of course a shorter play only one round or or two rounds this is how you play the barracks emperors i like the production of this game i like how the cards feel and look i like the fact that there's historical information about uh, about uh, the emperors on the cards um which is completely irrelevant to gameplay, but it's just like interesting to see that it doesn't look like a lot of people died of old age in the time of crisis of the Roman Empire and in the in the race to be the emperor, which didn't seem to be incredibly hard, but staying the emperor, that was fun. So there are little interesting touches here and there, which however don't make the game any more thematic. The game is an abstract game that happens to have interesting biographies of Roman emperors on the cards. I like the game, but I have a problem with it, which is my friends don't like it. I tried to play to multiplayer with them and they just don't like it. So I thought, well, I'm going to play it solo then. Um, first I tried two-handed and it's just too chaotic, too weird to be four parties split into two coalitions. But the game comes with a solo variant and I read the rules and at least to my taste is not the kind of solo variant that I'm particularly interested in because you're still going to control one faction and then you have to place cards for the other three factions following a simple AI but it doesn't matter how simple it is it's the kind of thing that I would want a natural AI like a digital thing maybe when if they have a conversion then uh, for the screen uh, that could work when I'm playing my card and then I see the other parties playing their cards and I can take mine when I play a game solo, if there is an AI, it has to take me less time to implement the AI than it takes me to take my turn. Thank you for attending my TED talk, and that's just my personal taste when it comes to AI. So after reading the rule book, this section, I was an interesting playing solo uh, with the solo variant. So what happened? What happened with my friends? Man, strong reactions! I, I don't think I had strong reactions like that around the table in quite a while. But they were frustrated and annoyed and they kept complaining about the game being too chaotic, too incomprehensible, it's too hard to get a sense of what's going on. While I was doing well and collecting cards and doing perfectly fine, trying to show them by example that worrying about each effect on the board, worrying about every single little tiny detail was not necessary to do well. So. What you have here is a game that looks like a trick-taking game, looks like an air control game, and it's uh, and because of that, uh, players maybe they're approaching with that idea of a strong strategy. But ultimately, the idea is that this is a very tactical game, which is about navigating, navigating chaos, not preventing it, not managing it. It is true that physically, because of the logistics of the game some effects are printed with their text and they may be far from you uh, but at least there is the border that reminds you which ones are the ones that you should keep an eye on but you still need to have a good general sense of a lot of things going on a lot of information but that's the point you need to be okay with that general sense being maybe good but not perfect. So we have a strange thing here because this is not a war game at all, but I did find that my war gaming mentality paid off because if I'm playing a game with hundreds of counters, I'm getting a sense that that part of the front is strong, that this part of the front is okay, I need some reinforcements there, maybe if the weather is good, I'll launch some operations next turn. I get this general planning mentality 
and I keep remaking my plans and looking for targets of opportunity? No, I don't know that that hex gives me two to one and the one next to it gives me three to one and that one, if I add uh, uh, air support, is going to give me four to one. I don't know that exactly. I get a sense. And this is what I found here, that I was enjoying waiting for my turn and looking for targets of opportunity. I wasn't planning ahead too much. Maybe one turn ahead. When I can get a high card and then I'm figuring out what to do with a low card. When there's really an emperor that I think is about to score and I think I know what I want to do next turn. But I didn't waste any time trying to plan two turns ahead. Uh, because it's not going to happen. Because of the players played, there are a lot of cards that happened, and effects connected to those cards. So this the battlefield or the, the field of agency changes all the time. I really, really enjoy being in this space of decision, which was about just navigating the storm without any hope of controlling it and seeing, oh, that's that opens an opportunity. Oh, that closes one. And then just working with targets of opportunities. I enjoyed a game that prevented my Eurogaming friends for from Eurogaming it too much. So, there may have been a mismatch there, they see the trick taking, they see the clear grid and they're thinking of classical positional games, checkers, chess go, maybe that's the idea, but I could see that my friends were struggling trying to control the whole thing and seeing that it didn't pay off and so they would double down and make sure, oh no, but next time I'm going to do better, I'm going to check every card absolutely to make sure that, but then so many effects change things around that that just does not matter. So... I don't know what the target on is going to be other than me and you watching that. Well, come visit. We can play together because I need human opponents to play this game because it has it has caused some really negative reactions in my group, uh, frustrations and complaints of the kind I haven't even really seen in a while. But I enjoyed it. <laughs> I personally enjoyed it. So... Uh, you need a word gamer maybe that has the word gaming mentality, but it's okay playing a game that is not. Because actually, I can see a word gamer starting grumbling that this is not how it worked, or, that's not how influence worked, the populace in Rome in that year, blah blah blah. So, you have a theme which is completely pasted on, but you need to have the kind of we're gaming mentality of being okay with the fog of war, with the fog of decision, with the limited understanding, with the chaos, with unpredictability. If you are okay with a tactical game that is based on that philosophy, then you and I are going to enjoy it. For now, this game, uh, well, is going to be on a shelf and I hope that I can find the right kind of people to play with because I think the Eurogamers, uh, you know, games that are players that are really into tight, clean strategy... In my group, they didn't enjoy it at all, and I see how that may annoy the uh, other similar players out there too.